If you have read through the Bible, how many of you have read 3 John chapter 2? Okay, next week we'll have a, a, a sermon on lying. Because there is no 3 John chapter 2. Open your Bibles today to the book of 3 John. There is only one chapter. Just a short little book, only 14 verses long. Now in a previous message, we looked at what gave John the Baptist joy. So we talked about the joy of John the Baptist, and the answer was that Christ was to increase and that he was to decrease. Remember, he was there, and he heard the voice of the bridegroom, and he was pointing people to Christ, and then he said, Thus my joy is fulfilled. Well, today we're going to look at another John, a different John. This is John the Beloved, or John the Apostle. John was the only one, by tradition, that we understand died of old age. Though there were persecutions against him, John lived to be an old man. It is said, again by tradition, that at the end of his life, all John could say was, Love one another. As they would carry him from place to place, he would repeat, Love one another. Love one another. He was continuing to remind his followers to fulfill the command of Christ. And remember, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, and verse 35, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. As John preached this message, as John preached his message of love, what gave him joy? And again, we want to ask ourselves the question, can we find this kind of joy? Can we have this kind of joy? And are we going to display this kind of joy? So let's examine 3 John. We're going to have a focus on verse 4, but I want to go ahead and read the entire book. So let's begin verse 1, 3 John. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loved to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doth good is of God, but he that doth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath a good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true." I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by thy name. This is unlike a lot of the letters in the New Testament that we have. Of course, this is an epistle. It's a letter. But it was not written to any particular church. It was written to a man by the name of Gaius. And Gaius is addressed as John's child. There, as we read again in verse 4, it says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And in verse 3, we had just learned that John was praising Gaius for continuing to walk in truth. And so what we see here is that Gaius would have been taught and discipled by John. 
Normally when we see this phrase in Scripture, children, it's a reference to being saved under the ministry of the one that's speaking. As Paul often called Timothy his son in the ministry, so John here writes, and he calls Gaius one of his children. And what we find in this wonderful letter is that Gaius was practicing what John taught. He was continuing in truth. He was continuing in love. He was continuing to be hospitable to the brethren. And the neat part is, even in John's absence. We talked a little bit in Sunday school this morning how, you know, when a pastor walks into a room, everybody changes their behavior. Everybody changes their demeanor, and they want to be real holy while the preacher's around, but when the preacher disappears, they go back to doing what they, they normally do. And I like to remind people, folks, God is always watching. It's not just around me. You have to be nice and holy and right. Matter of fact, I'd appreciate it if you don't put on a, a false uh, attitude around me. Just be who you are and let God work in your life. But uh, what we see here is that Gaius, again, was practicing what John was teaching him. And Gaius's continuance in the faith made John happy. We have it said again, this is the joy of John the Beloved. What made joy, what gave John the Beloved such joy? What made him happy? Well, verse 4 tells us, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. When we hear about people who have been led to Christ under our ministry, and sometimes we wonder, where are they now? What are they doing now? And when we hear a report that says, this person is still doing what God wanted them to do, they're still involved in their local church, they're still teaching and preaching and practicing and doing all the things that a good person, a good child of God is supposed to do, that makes us happy because, number one, we as preachers and pastors, and I can imagine John felt this way about Gaius, it's that, he got it. They got it. They understood it. Yes, they, they took the concept of Jesus Christ, and they understood it, and they took it to themselves, and they're living it out. They understand. You know, it's those times that people don't seem to continue to walk in the truth. We go, what are you doing? Guys, come on, wake up. It's not that hard. We, we're supposed to follow Christ and do what Christ wants us to do. It's a life of dedication to Christ. But here we see that, Paul, or that John was commending Gaius. Because, folks, there was a testimony involved here. Let me ask you a question. How did John know what Gaius was doing? He wrote this letter to Gaius to commend him of his actions, but John was somewhere else. How did John know to write Gaius this letter? Ah, notice verse 3. Pardon? God taught, well, yeah, he wrote this by divine inspiration, but, but again we see in verse 3, it says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. There were some brethren that had visited with Gaius, and then they came and they visited with John, and they said, you know that guy Gaius, he's a really good guy. He's walking in truth. He's practicing love. He was very hospitable to us. He was a good guy. And the testimony of Gaius was a testimony of his conduct and his behavior. Maybe Gaius didn't even realize these guys were watching. Maybe he didn't understand. Maybe he didn't know it wasn't out of the ordinary to Gaius to just be hospitable and do the things that he was supposed to do. That was his normal habit. But it was a testimony to others that he knew Christ. It was a testimony to others that he loved. And again, what did Jesus say in John 13, 35? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, by your love one to another. Can we say that Gaius was a disciple of Jesus Christ? He was a follower of Jesus Christ by being a follower of John who was a follower of Jesus Christ. And so he was displaying the testimony. He was displaying the testimony that the gospel had in his life. He was a living testimony to the gospel. And folks, this is one of the reasons why it is so important to remain in the truth. Turn your Bibles over to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, 
chapter 4, verses I've used many, many, many times with you all. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If we do not live a life dedicated to Christ, if we hide the gospel within ourselves, if we do not allow the love of Christ to be shed abroad in our hearts and therefore to scatter and to spread to others, we are hiding our gospel. And if we're hiding our gospel, who are we hiding it from? Those that need it the most. Saved people do not need the gospel. Lost people need the gospel. They need to hear it. They need to see it. Verse three or 4 says, In whom, that is in the lost, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They have a hindrance in Satan. Satan has blinded their eyes. He's blinded their minds so that they cannot see the light of Christ. And it's our job to shine the light of Christ into their hearts, to shine the light of Christ before them so that they can see that the Holy Spirit can take the Word of God and our testimony and share it with them so they may be saved. Verse 5 says, For we preach not ourselves. We preach not ourselves. It's not about my glory. It's not about how many disciples I can get to my name. It's not about how big a crowd I can draw because my name is so popular. I don't preach myself. It's not about self-exaltation because if it's about self-exaltation, Christ is not exalted. But he says we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So the important parts of this, this portion of Scripture to me are, number one, we don't need to hide our gospel. And we need to preach Christ. And we can go back to 3 John and realize that because of Gaius, the gospel was being displayed. Because of the love he was showing, go back to 1 John for, or 3 John, excuse me, 3 John for a minute. Notice something about the testimony that John gives about Gaius. He says in verse 5, Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Who are those strangers? They're the unsaved. You have two groups of people here. You have the brethren, which would be those who are saved, who are together with him, who are serving with him, who are children of God. They are the brethren. And to strangers, those are those ones who are separated. Those are those ones who are not part of the family. Those are the ones who are out there that need the gospel. And what is he doing? He's being faithful to preach the gospel. He's being faithful to live the truth. He's helping the brethren, but he's also doing this to strangers. Unfortunately, we find in this small little letter of 14 verses that not everybody practiced the concept that Gaius practiced. Not everyone did what Gaius was doing. We read about, in verse 9, a man named Diotrephes. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Diotrephes. Now this is an interesting thing, because here it says that I wrote unto the church. John had written a letter to this church. It seems to be that Gaius was a member of this congregation. He was a faithful member of this congregation. But this congregation had not received the letter. They hadn't heard from John. And John is wondering, why isn't this church hearing from me? And these brethren come back and they testify to the actions of Gaius. More than likely they testified also to the actions of Diotrephes. And so John ends up writing to Gaius because if he continues to write to Diotrephes, Diotrephes isn't sharing the letter with the church. Why is Diotrephes 
not sharing the letter. We read about him. It says there in verse 9 that he receiveth us not. In verse 10, we have more of his action. He said, I will remember his deeds. What was he doing? He was pratting against us with malicious words. He was speaking out against John. And not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren. So he says, I don't want anybody to come from John. But he says also, and he forbiddeth them that would. There were others in the church that would have received the messengers from John. More than likely, men like Gaius. What was Diotrephes' attitude toward them? He says in verse 10, he casted them out of the church. He excluded them. Why was he doing this? Diotrephes was not welcoming of brethren. Maybe he saw it as a threat. He had enough influence over the group that he was, he was dictating these things. He didn't respect John's influence. And think about that. Who was John the Beloved? He was one of the original apostles. He walked, he talked, he ate with Jesus Christ himself. He was the one that laid on Jesus during the Last Supper. He was one that had seen Jesus Christ resurrected. He had been there personally. Here was somebody who knew what he was talking about. But Diotrephes says, no, I'm more important. I can tell you what you need to know. Don't worry about John. Don't worry about this other stuff. I'll tell you. Because again, in verse 9 it says, He loveth to have the preeminence. He loveth to have the preeminence. It's the Greek word, philo protivon. Simply means, he loves to be first. He loves to be first. When I read that, I was kind of reminded just a little bit of elementary school. I like to volunteer at the elementary school. And sometimes the kids have to line up. And you know what all the kids do? I'm first, I'm first, I'm first. I get to be line leader. No, you were line leader last week. And I get to be line leader now. And they'll fight over who gets to be first in line. They're going to be the line leader because that's the important person. And everybody has to follow the line leader. Look, is the person at the end of the line going to get to the same place? Yeah. Besides, who's really the line leader? The teacher. The teacher tells you where to go. But they want to be seen as something. They want to have a title. I'm line leader. Kids will fight over that stuff, you know. Teachers actually have to come up with a whole chart of, of titles. You've got the, the line leader and the, the book person and the, and the floor sweeper and the stair checker or the, the chair stacker. Everybody's got to have a title because they can seem as important. Isn't it more important that the job gets done? Folks, when it comes to service for Jesus Christ, isn't it more important that the job gets done? It's not about who gets the credit because really who's supposed to get the credit? Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. As one man said, I'm just one beggar trying to tell another beggar where to find bread. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. And so here, Diotrephes, he withstood John. He didn't welcome those whom John sent. He excluded those that would welcome them. Diotrephes was seeking honor for himself and not for Christ. Go back and look at verse 7 for a minute. John is writing to Gaius, and he talks about these people, these, these brethren who were there. And it says here in, in verse 7, Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. What does the phrase for his name's sake mean? Folks, it means for Christ's sake. These brethren who were traveling back and forth, they didn't want to take anything from the Gentiles because they didn't want to be accused. They didn't want to have a reputation of, of taking from those people. They wanted to, as the Bible says, live of the gospel. So they didn't take anything to be an extra burden on the Gentiles because they wanted to be a testimony of Christ. Do you realize that there are sects of, of, of people today that go around claiming to be 
ministers of God who do nothing but beg. That's what they live their life as beggars, living off of other people. And they say, we're going to, to live off of other people, and you're supposed to give to us because we're holy people, and, and we're just going to live our lives based on that. There's a whole group of monks that do that. They're sponges on society. When Paul was preaching the gospel and he went to the Gentiles, you remember what he did? He went and worked as a tent maker. He worked with his own hands so that the Corinthians had nothing to accuse him of. They couldn't say that he was just after their money. What do people accuse Christians of today? We're just after their money. And we have a lot of people on TV that are giving them ammunition. Yeah. Folks, it's not about our name, our reputation. It's about Jesus Christ. It should be for His name's sake, not for ours. Diotrephes was seeking honor for himself, not for Christ. What made John the Beloved so happy? Folks, it was seeing those whom he had reached with the gospel, reaching others with the gospel. Them living a life separated unto Christ brought him great joy. And I want to share with you Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I picked out two words in this verse. The first word is the word obey. And I really don't want to launch into another sermon about the word obey, but the word obey here isn't meant as submission to a dictator. It's not the idea of doing whatever the pastor says, because again, it's not about pastoral rule. This is Jesus Christ's church, not mine. Okay? It's not about pastoral rule. This is from the Greek word pitho, which means to assent to, to rely on, to agree, or to have confidence in. True pastors are looking out for the souls of their flocks. Pastors are going to give an account. That's the second word I pointed out here is the word joy. Pastors are going to give an account. And we pray that they can do it with joy. Do it with joy. John, when he reported on Gaius, how did he feel toward Gaius? He was happy. He had joy toward Gaius because Gaius had got it and Gaius was living it out. And he could report, you know, when, when John finally died as an old man and he stood before Jesus and Jesus asked him, well, John, how did it go? You know, that, this is hypothetical, but John, how did it go? How was Gaius? And John could say, oh, Gaius, he was wonderful, Jesus. He lived the model life. He was kind to the brethren. He was loving. He did all these wonderful things because he wanted to show them you. Gaius deserves to hear Jesus, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, John, how about Diotrephes? Oh, Jesus. Diotrephes. Uh, he's probably saved. I mean, he's a church member. More than likely, he was maybe even the pastor. But, but Lord, oh, he was not living the gospel. He's, he's recognized as a brother, but he's not living the life that testifies to you. And how do you think John is going to report? He's going to report it with heartache. Oh, Jesus, he had such potential. Jesus, he could have done such great things for you, but he just loved to have the preeminence. Caused John heartache. Further, you know, I have to believe that those who remain lost caused John heartache. John was saying, love one another. Disciples of Jesus, love one another. Show them your love for one another. Show them what they can have in Jesus Christ. This undying love, this peace that passes all understanding. Show them. And yet there are still some that would say, no, I don't want any part of Jesus. Oh, what 
heartache. The lost caused John great pain. And folks, I have to say today, the lost should cause us great pain, great heartache. To have great compassion on them because they need to know Jesus Christ as their Savior before they find themselves in a place called hell, in eternal torment. Do we share John's pain for the lost? Are we living a life of testimony like Gaius did? Are we living a life that would bring those that led us to Christ joy? I'm going to be a little selfish today, and I'm going to beg you and beseech you, please be my joy. Please walk in truth. Please follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Not for my name's sake. Please don't do it for me. But do it for the name of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. Do it for His glory and His honor. And folks, if you will live a life that brings honor and glory to Jesus Christ, you will be my joy and the joy of many others who have gone before me and the joy of many others who possibly will come after me. But do it for the Lord Jesus Christ because there's a lost world that needs to know Jesus Christ. Do you know Him today? And are you living a life of testimony? Let's stand together. Turn our hymnals to hymn number 390. And the question is, is your all on the altar?